I'm just going to give the readers a heads up that if you go into this book thinking this is a discussion of freedom or how free you are in a society, the first paragraph you read is going to disabuse you of that notion very quickly. May I quote? Please. Please do. Oh, great. It's such a wonderful passage. This is the very first paragraph of this book. I knew you would like this, Seth. On 2nd of March, 1757, Damien's the Regicide was condemned to make an amende en abre before the main door of the Church of Paris, where he was to be taken and conveyed in a cart, wearing nothing but a shirt, holding a torch of burning wax weighing two pounds. Then in said cart, to the Place de Greve, where on a scaffold that will be erected there, the flesh will be torn from his breasts, arms, thighs, and calves with red-hot pinchers, his right hand holding the knife with which he committed the said parricide, burnt with sulfur, and on those places where the flesh will be torn away, poured molten lead, boiling oil, burning resin, wax, and sulfur melted together, and then his body drawn and quartered by four horses, and his limbs and body consumed by fire, reduced to ashes, and his ashes thrown to the winds. And that's just the short version of the... Yeah, this goes on for three pages. That's yes. When we get the longer account. And we're not going to read any more details like that because you get the idea. And there's plenty of it. But those were the good old days where power was more obvious. It was wielded more explicitly and obviously, right? Right, exactly. That's what's interesting about these new disciplinary forms of power is that they operate surreptitiously. You don't even notice the ways in yeah. which you're being influenced by them. Yeah. So in a way, it's more dangerous because it's easy to identify the source of power when you're looking at a model of sovereignty or the spectacle of punishment. It's easy to say, oh, that's the source of my domination. Let's just get mm -hmm. rid of the king. But it's much harder when it's masked and distributed in these institutions in which we ourselves participate and all of that. Yes. So it takes Foucault a little while to get to the point that Katie just brought up from this original description of this torture and at the beginning of the book. He starts here, obviously, for a purpose. And the purpose, I think, is he wants to talk about the transition of a system of punishment that was in place, I guess, prior to the revolution. I don't want to go so far as to align it specifically with a particular historical period, but... He said 18th to 19th. <clears throat> yeah, 18th century is the before. Most crimes were essentially violent and affected on persons' bodies, and then the punishment was on the offender's body. That the system of punishment that existed was essentially to extract some kind of justice. I don't know if that's the right word. Revenge. Or some kind of revenge, retribution on the body of the criminal. This was done very publicly as an expression of the sovereign's power and with the complicity of the public. And he needs to establish this because he's going to talk about how it transitions from that to this idea of discipline and system, which is going to go along with the change in the social order as well. And this is a good place to bring up. So I put up a post on partiallyexaminedlife.com before we recorded this a couple of weeks and invited people to ask questions. So there's one question by a guy named who calls himself Voltard on there, where he says, uh, Foucault dismisses concepts such as human nature, universal human rights, justice, humanism, objective truth, etc. And is he obsessed with what is perhaps the central issue of his work, namely power? I don't get it. <laughs> We've already said a little bit about what his concept of power is and why he's concerned with it. But in terms of this narrative, the thing that he's trying to fight against is it's very natural to think, oh, those people were a bunch of savages. And then we got the notions of human rights. We had great reformers like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, perhaps, and a bunch of French guys whose names I don't remember, who argued that we should punish more humanely. And so we started right. doing that and the sovereign lost power and just everybody became more free and happy. And that's exactly what Foucault wants to argue against. Yes, there was a change. It was more a change just because it wasn't working that well, the old system, for various reasons. But power is still exerted in the new system. It's just in a different, more subtle way. Right. Yeah, well, the old system was becoming a little more dangerous for the sovereign. Foucault puts this emphasis on the ways in which things could go wrong and the crowd might end up sympathizing with the person who was being publicly tortured and executed. And when power is wielded in such obvious ways, it subjects you to some danger, right? It's when it goes underground that you really, you get a much nicer 
and uh, safer form of control. He also makes the point maybe later on that this genealogy depends a lot on the development of the mercantile economy and other forces in the social order that makes it much more palatable for such a rise of discipline. In fact, it's not clear to me that he would say that discipline was born exactly. Maybe he would say that, but it seems to me it's a question of which kind of display or form of power comes to dominate within a society. And that it's certainly not as if there wasn't such a thing as discipline before 1800s. No, yeah. I think you're right. right. You're right. Yeah. I mean, the Roman armies were full of discipline, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. This is another feature of power in general for Foucault is that it's going to be self-organizing. So you do end up with fluctuations in which specific form of power becomes most pervasive. As norms get reinforced more effectively by certain means, those means become the dominant means. Did Foucault ever analyze Sparta? Not as far as I know. Because that seems to me like the, per the perfect example of something almost like a panoptic society. It's incredibly disciplined. There are specific rules for everybody. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And it's obviously and self-consciously a form of education, both militarily and culturally. We don't have to try to make that analysis ourselves. It just it strikes me that it can't possibly be the case that discipline as a form of power is, is something that's sort of born now. It has got to be more to do with the way it, this kind of transition. It would probably be unfair to characterize Foucault as saying that discipline is something that emerges with the rise of the middle class and mercantilism and the overthrow of the monarchy and this sort of ushering into a modern industrial age. His concept of discipline in this book is tied to the system of observation and the idea of a society that is ordered under this power structure that Katie mentioned, where people are essentially influenced to police themselves out of fear of being caught. But I feel like we might be jumping ahead and we should roll back a little bit. There's a reason he spends a fair amount of time on this initial section, establishing what he calls an economy of punishment underneath the sovereign and the system that we have, and then it transitions from that to this other model. Well, let's return to that criticism later, though, after we... Because I think it's a, Dylan's question there is important. I think it's a fair question. So where would you like us to begin? Then? I was flabbergasted at how long we spent on punishment when it seems to be his most important conclusion had to do with discipline. So trying to lay out why it matters so much to spend 150 pages on um, punishment and the transition. And he has really three stages, right? Or three ways of organizing punishment, monarchical law, reforming jurists, and the prison. And then there's, he calls them three technologies of power regarding punishment. And then it's from there that we have the transition into this new form of discipline. Saying why he does that and why it's necessary is, I think, worthwhile. So why don't we talk about some of the characteristics of the system of punishment that he lays out in the initial section and this idea that punishment is a manifestation of the power of the sovereign. So a crime against the body politic is a crime against the king. The king is in a position where the, the king needs to express and maintain his power over the populace. And punishment in this very public forum is one way in which that is accomplished. But it's important that there's a whole system that supports this model that's going to turn out to change quite a bit over time. So, for example, the accused is not permitted to view the evidence against him or her. There's a panel of judges or some sort of an executor or magistrate who represents the sovereign, and he decides whether the accused is guilty or innocent. Foucault makes a point of talking about how torture was employed as a way to ensure that the accused would confess. So in other words, guilt is already determined without what we would consider to be a trial or a fair hearing or an evidentiary inquisition. The, the idea of the inquisition existed, but it all takes place in secrecy behind closed doors. So that's important that we understand that when the crime occurs and then the criminal is incarcerated pending the punishment, all of what we would consider to be standard mechanisms of the judicial system 
are in secret. The punishment itself, however, is quite public. And this will become important later, obviously, because those two things are flip-flopped when we get to the system of discipline. So he does spend a fair amount of time talking about how this is really almost like a theater and less what we would consider to be a system of justice. Punishment is tied not so much to a system of justice, but to a system of torture where the criminal is essentially compelled under this power structure to take part or is tortured into complicity. What's the conceit behind that structure? The kind of defense that you would make of it? Ignoring the torture part, the idea of having an authority that makes decisions for those they have authority over, it's like a family. The kids don't make decisions, really. The parents make decisions for the good of the children, and that's their job. And if they don't do that, then they've failed in that job. And if you take it seriously, ignoring potentials of corruption and stuff like that, a king is the father of his subjects and is responsible for their well-being. And therefore, his judgment is the only judgment that makes sense. I'm saying that only to try to make sense of why you would start with that kind of system. There's a reason why this structure exists, and there's a way of defending it, even if it doesn't hold up in the end. And that's what I'm trying to reach for. It's not about capricious torture. That's not the goal of it, right? Absolutely not. No, certainly not. It has its own logic of operation, or it wouldn't have been implemented in the first place. The public spectacle of torture works, right? You don't want to be tortured. So you don't do whatever it was that that guy did, <laughs> the one who's being <laughs> tortured, right? I mean, it makes very good sense. And in terms of the sovereignty issue, the transgressive act, the crime is, as you said, a crime against the sovereign. And the sovereign's power has to be restored publicly. The public has to have the absolute knowledge that it is the sovereign who lays down the law. That's why this exercise of power has to be so public. It's reestablishing who's in charge. Right. It's described as a, if you commit a crime, it's an act of war on your part. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm brought to mind of that image of uh, the sovereign on the cover of the standard edition of Hobbes Leviathan. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking of that. Yep. The criminal act is an act against is essentially a metaphorical crime against the body of the sovereign. And so the punishment is extracted on the body of the criminal. Yeah. Well, that image, the body of the sovereign is composed of a bunch of the people, right, Seth? Mm -hmm. And so Dylan was saying, what's the conceit behind this? And when you said that, and the way I think about it when I read it is, this is sort of the Hobbesian archetype in play, that he's talking about how punishment and how power works in the dynamic of the Hobbesian sovereign. I just want to point out the importance here of the punishment being enacted on the body, because this, I think, is going to be an important switch in disciplinary power. It's the body of the criminal that's punished, and the only relevant question is, was this act committed by this person? They don't care about questions that are going to come up later, like, what kind of person is this? Does this person have a criminal nature? There's nothing like that. There's no reference to what's going on in the mind of the individual, and there's no effort to change the minds of individuals. It's about discouraging criminal actions only. Mm, right. Yeah, that's a critical point. Did anybody else feel like this is like retributive justice in like the old school, like biblical sense? Well, he says, I mean, that's part of the reason for the extreme continuing to torture the body after the person is dead, bringing the person <laughs> to the point of death and like reviving them and then torturing some more to the point of death. These things that if you try to actually implement an eye for an eye, then uh, if somebody does something bad enough, you, you can't, you can't implement that. And for instance, a regicide, since you're just a peon subject and you're killing or even attempting to kill somebody whose life is worth so much more than yours, then... By that Old Testament logic, you should be killed multiple times. Yeah, he refers to oh, yeah. somebody writing a political essay of like, you know, why hanging is not bad enough or something. That brings up another point too. sort of piggybacking on what Katie said. It's very focused on the body. It's just a question of guilt or innocence. There's no such thing as a mitigating circumstance. Not interested in reforming 
the criminal not interested in understanding motivations. Nobody cares, or I shouldn't say it's not part of the, as Foucault would say, the economy of this system exactly. to account for those things. And another aspect of it is that it's completely up to the discretion of the authorities in the particular case to determine the punishment. So this particular punishment is an extreme example, but it's not unique. And that you get into this system where they're trying to devise tortures to match what they consider to be the heinousness of the crime. That there's no system or no ledger that says, for this crime, this is the appropriate punishment, or for this crime, this is the appropriate punishment. Instead, in every single case, the individuals involved make the decision about what's to be. And that's why you have all of these unbelievably just folks listening. He's got example after example in this book of terrible things that are done to people. It's not sufficient to simply imitate what's previously been done. There's a sense of creativity that comes into play. So it's chaotic, it's uneven, but it all stems from this. It all flows from this authority of the sovereign. So there's a sense in which just by exacting that retribution on the body of the criminal, you're accomplishing the goal within the economy of the system as it stands in that era. And so political economy, this term, he likes to put these slightly disparate terms together, right? Like the microphysics of power we already saw and the technology of the body, these other, other things like that. And so I guess what I was interpreting political economy is talking about is just really how much effort does it take to achieve this political purpose? And that's ultimately what makes this type of a punishment doomed, because if you're doing it in a public spectacle, well, then there's too much risk of the public, for instance, especially if they don't agree with the verdict, rebelling against that. Or he talks about the public taking it as a sign if something goes wrong. So the person is hung, but the scaffold doesn't quite work. And so they, they're not dead yet. So there's a definite sense that, uh, well, you should let them off. It's sort, of, it's sort of like a trial by combat. He talks about the executioner being the king's representative in combat with the person to be executed. Of course, very stacked contest. And so that's why I was very illuminated by this phrase, and she shall be hung by the neck until dead. But they actually had to say that because sometimes it wouldn't work the first time and they wanted to cut off the people rising up. And uh, so why the thing shifted is all about these calculations of political economy. It, it was just because this is supposed to be a massive deterrent and it didn't work. It didn't work in the uh, shifting times when there were more people and the standard of living was higher and that the types of crimes were less and the political environment was changing. And it just didn't work anymore. Right. He even talks about sort of this cultural realization that the severity of the punishment, the gruesomeness of the punishment, was seen to exceed the crime. And that's where the economy of power now is off balance, right? The debt yeah. being paid is greater, or the punishment is greater than the actual debt owed. And when this was sort of realized on a wide scale, the system couldn't be maintained anymore. It was too open to criticism. I was trying to get at how we're using the word economy here, because it sounded like when you just were using it, you're just using economy as the balance of power, but the balance of power is supposed to be extremely out of whack in favor of the sovereign. That's the whole point. But a calculation of political economy is if you're the sovereign, then whatever the forces are that are trying to keep order in society, what is the cheapest way to make that happen? And if you have the populace, as they're supposed to, helping out and going along and being witnesses to the guilt of this person and the rightness of the sovereign, then it's working according to this political economy. But if they're not, if they feel sorry because this punishment is just so horrible that it elicits its pity, then that throws the political economy off. It necessitates a different decision. You're absolutely right. I think Foucault talks about the economy of all sorts of things, and the economy of punishment is this relationship of the criminal being indebted. But yes, you're absolutely right. What we were talking about with the political economy is how much does it cost the sovereign to exert his power? And if everybody's going along with it, it doesn't cost him very much. But when it gets harder and harder to implement, maybe we want to look for a cheaper mode of power. Also, what throws that balance off is the inherent contradiction between the need to make the sentence legible on the body of the criminal and then the pettiness of newer crimes, right? Yeah. So to make the sentence legible on the body means to do these horrible things, to torture. That's part of what makes it this very public 
thing. And that's great if the criminal is a regicide or an attempted regicide. But if it's shoplifting, if the sentiments of the public say that, you know, the punishment must fit the crime, well, you can't take the shoplifter up and slap them on the wrist. That's not exactly making the sentence legible anymore. So there's an inherent contradiction between the types of crimes that are being committed and this need for legibility or for visibility. Russ, you hit on something that I was wondering about, which is, isn't it the case that the kinds of crimes that the sovereign wants to punish are going to be changing or are changing? So that part of that economy is that the very pieces of the economy that need to be controlled now are changing so that yeah, exactly. you can't have this kind of punishment regime anymore. Because, I mean, for instance, you're not going to... Wes gave the example of shoplifting, but if we take the extreme example now of white-collar crime, any of those sorts of things that have to do with the functioning of something like the monetary economy are the development of uh, mercantilism and the, the merchant class and all those sorts of things. You're going to have all kinds of crimes that you want to punish because you want to dissuade people from committing them, but now you no longer have the means to punish them properly. To me, that makes a little bit more sense of this transition. There's sort of the fact of the transition, but there's a kind of underlying dynamic behind that transition regarding what sorts of things the society as a... If I think of these powers as being the things that hold the society together as a society, and different sorts of society have different balances or physics behind them, to use Foucault's way of speaking, then the transition is going to be facilitated or prompted by a change in the kinds of society that you're going to have. It's going to demand a new kind of underlying physics. Now, it might have its own problems, which Foucault wants to highlight. Yeah, there's a reason why he's using the word micro, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, Dylan, you're right. It's, there's a correlation between the magnitude of the offenses and the magnitude of the exertion of power, and power goes underground, or power becomes micro, just at the point where, I guess, the certain changes in the economy and other things make for many micro sorts of crimes. So maybe we should talk about this term microphysics a yeah. bit, actually. So what Foucault says is that, I'm quoting now, the history of this microphysics of punitive power would then be a genealogy or an element in a genealogy of the modern soul. I think there is so much packed into this sentence that it might be worth talking about for a minute, at least what he means by microphysics. Mm -hmm. What he's doing is he's looking at the microphysics of punitive power, of the power to punish. And I think one thing he means by microphysics is what we've already been saying about the magnitude of the crime. How big is the problem we're dealing with? That kind of question. Is it a big problem? Is it a small problem? He also, once he gets to disciplinary power, starts talking about how the body is broken down into ever smaller units to be trained. And I think that is a, an important element in this microphysics of punitive power. How does it act on the small units of the body? But I think there's another sense of microphysics here that's really important and applies to his project pretty generally. What microphysics means to a physicist, and I know because I asked one before I started talking to you guys. <laughs> Thank God, because there's no physicists on this call. <laughs> <laughs> Microphysics is the level of physics where the classical Newtonian model doesn't work anymore. And I think this is so linked to what Foucault is trying to do. When he gets into disciplinary power, the old model of power, the model of the sovereign, doesn't capture what's going on with disciplinary power. Our classical model of power that we all walk around with implicitly, that power is exercised from the top down, that sort of thing, that classical model has to be thrown out the window when you get to disciplinary power. And I think that's maybe an important sense of microphysics that we should uh, keep in mind. I think part of that's going to have to be tied up in the need in whatever this new version of society is, is going to demand a technology that goes down to that level. Right. Those societies worked, right? I mean, in the sense that they had their own rules. 
putting aside questions of judgment about their justice, it's it must to saying they have their own dynamic. And it's a top-down dynamic. And one of the consequences is, for instance, that you're not really a criminal unless you get caught. People are constantly getting out of the jurisdiction. It's like the Wild West. Whereas, you know, in this new era of discipline, you have the need to get down to a level of social, this micro level that doesn't admit of this classical version of power for the same reason why it works in physics, right? Because it's not like classical physics doesn't work. It's that classical physics doesn't work down to a certain level. Once you get to a certain scale, you need to start paying attention to other kinds of interactions and other ways of interacting that are not classical anymore. The basic idea is that power is decentralized, that it's not just the sovereign or by analogy in physics, one yes. body acting on another impassive body, although we know that even at the Newtonian level, that's not exactly the best way to put it, but power is distributed among all agents or all human beings, or, or really you could say it's out, it's in the system, let's say, or it's outside of them, it's that micro. It's relational? Yeah. Well, the other thing about micro, too, he's getting at the division of space and time. You know, he, he likes those timetables. But even the idea of making a schedule, you know, it occurs to me when people say they're busy or I'm tending to my calendar the way I've divided up the day, you know, we're no longer torturing and dividing up bodies into pieces. We divide up our days into pieces. We torture out our days and that's the way we apply discipline to ourselves. So that's, it's micro in that sense. We do a lot of dividing in our discipline. Is that a self-confessional analogy or is that a, from someone who prefers not to be disciplined about what he does from minute to minute? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> you using that phrase makes me think either it's a, yes, this is the modern age. We all torture ourselves and divide our days like this, or you suckers torture yourselves and divide mm -hmm. your days <laughs> But I am too smart for that. No, I'm trying to paraphrase the argument. I, ah. I independent of what I, whether I agree with it or not. <laughs> yes, it does occur to me that people can be overscheduled and that I can be overscheduled and those sorts of things. But I haven't made an evaluation of whether I uh, think that argument works. I just, uh, I see that as part of the argument. Yeah, this is something that Foucault talks about, right? Immediately after that description of the regicide being drawn and quartered and tortured in various ways. The very next thing he gives you is a timetable from yeah. like 70 years later, 80 years later, something like that. Yeah. And it's so detailed. It's what the prisoners are going to do every 15 minutes, right? And mm -hmm. I think the idea there, to link this back to the micro discussion, is that the smaller divisions you make in how these prisoners are supposed to use their time, every minute is accounted for. There's no time for criminal activity when you have to be out of bed at 5 a.m., dressed by 5.15, at breakfast at 5.30, out in the work yard at 5.45. And that's something Foucault is going to link to the ways we organize institutions now. I mean, I think one of the main takeaways from this book is look at the way your schools are like these prisons. Look at the way the factories are like these prisons. We micromanage every minute of our day. That exact description is where I think that it fails to take into account something like the lessons of a real quantum mechanics. I mean that utterly sincerely in that this kind of way of talking about the micro organization is one that is still involved with direct cause and effect. It might be multiple causes and effect, but it's still classical in that respect. Yeah, I don't think there's a good analogy to quantum mechanics in this. because no. I think it's more about decentralization of force. It's not about undermining the idea of force itself. Maybe a better example would be evolution or something. Something in which the whole arises out of the individuals, right? Out of the actions of the individuals. And maybe that's part of what's going on there, or what he imagines being the better case where you allow for a structure that has all the individuals acting together. But the kind of prescriptive behavior of a prison or a school seems to still be often top-down. Well, the idea of the non-top-down part comes with 
surveillance and with people regulating their own discipline. The idea is that in the panopticon, you no longer need people to explicitly know that someone else is looking. They've internalized it, right? And so they do these things now of their own accord. And you certainly don't need to torture them. You just need to instill discipline in them. And then they behave in these ways of their own accord. If I were listening here, that's about the second time we've used the term panoptical or panopticon. Okay. And I think we have to define what it is since it's so important. We might as well do it now. Go for it. Somebody else. Well, before Foucault, philosopher Jeremy Bentham wrote about this idea of uh, the panopticon. The panopticon is a structure that has, so you've got a, a central tower where somebody in charge can oversee what's happening around them. And then you've got these, this sort of circle of individual cells around that central tower where each cell would contain a single prisoner. They would not be able to communicate with each other or see, even see each other, but they can all be seen by this central tower. And the key feature here is that the prisoners can never see if there's someone actually in the tower watching them. So one-way mirror. He didn't have that technology. Yeah, right. It's a one-way mirror. Exactly. So the idea is, if at every moment there's a chance that you could be seen by an authority figure, you're not going to misbehave all the time, right? Because of the chance that you could be seen, you're going to end up surveilling yourself and internalizing that authority. So the beautiful thing about this is nobody actually has to be in that central tower. Nobody has to be exercising power in order for power to be exercised. It's brilliantly efficient in that way. Yeah. I like the elaborate image that he is painted in here. I mean, I haven't looked at the original Bentham work, but you know, it doesn't have to be just you know a single layer of cells. I mean, just imagine a sort of multi-story, almost spherical thing where you just have these cells at every possible angle and there's some kind of little telescope or something that the person, they could be even very far away from the tower, but just, and they're all backlit. So this is sort of the opposite of what prisons were thought of before as these dank places. Like, oh, they're all open. You have a whole side open and it's not dark like these traditional prisons. It's you're backlit. So you are extremely visible to whoever's going to be in the tower, which they could be looking at you with their little spy eye. So it could just be this massive, uh, I don't know, I was picturing something out of Doctor Who or something. This has to be the most evil thing, by the way, I've ever <laughs> Bentham. And it's presented as a great the reformer. reformer. Yeah. Right. So Bentham, he actually describes this as a prison, right? I mean, this is a plan for a prison specifically. Right. Yeah, and Bentham tried to get this prison made and was very disappointed that it never happened. But he thought also that the structure itself, and this is what Foucault really takes off on, could then be applied to many, many kinds of organizations. Foucault says that even though this actual prison didn't get made, it was a pretty influential idea for a lot of kinds of organizations so that you just try to structure. Yeah. I mean, cubicles in our office places are set up sort of like this or just the way students are laid out in classes, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, it reminds yeah. me of my attempts at privacy <laughs> working in offices where I would basically make sure that my computer screen was not visible to anyone, <laughs> despite the fact that often cubicles are basically designed so that anyone can walk by and see that you're not on salon.com or something like that. I would find another piece of cubicle and basically enclose myself <laughs> in a little prison where at least there was some privacy and I could surf the web when I needed to. That's the interesting thing about the Panopticon is that it actually makes the dungeon look appealing, right? Exactly. Well, it also relies on the prisoner knowing that they are being surveilled. Or knowing that or at any be. moment yeah. they could be. Okay, fine. But th that's a distinction that doesn't make a difference, right? The whole goal of it is having to work on the mind of the prisoner. But what I'm saying is the right. most important thing is that they understand that they are, could be, or are being surveilled. Right. That's right, Wes. They're logging your internet activity. And the reason that matters is is that changes their behavior so that it's not I mean, I understand this is the way it's supposed to be working. I guess maybe I'm reacting to the notion of it being a laboratory. There's this whole discussion in there about how now you can see the way in which people behave and understand the human soul, which is just not going to be true, right? Because you've 
now affected the way it's behaving. But I think the larger important point is how does power really work and how are people coerced into doing things? And I come back to this idea of recognition. And I mean, the idea is that much of what I do is governed by other people's expectations and opinions that I've basically internalized. And that's in large part how power gets exercised. I think that's a really important point. Yeah, I think to go back to what you said about the soul, I don't think it's so much about seeing the operation of the soul. The important point here is this is how the soul gets formed. Right. By creating this kind of relationship with yourself. Um, Exactly. This self-monitoring, self-discipline. This is why Foucault says this is a genealogy of the modern soul. He's talking about how this concept of a particular kind of self with a particular kind of moral responsibility really gets inculcated, I think. Yeah. Subjection is the creation of the subject. Exactly. This is how subjects are formed. I think somebody might have to slow down and walk me through that. Well, yeah, let's see. Maybe we should get at the transition. So now we've sketched out the beginning point of his historical story of the sovereign doing these nasty things. And then some of the the reasons why that might have moved forward, the political economy wasn't working. And we have the end point, which is this idea of the panopticon, where even though part of it is a discussion of the structure of a potential prison, the larger implication, the reason why, again, say the question for this episode should ultimately be, are we really free, is that the most effective way to fight crime, to keep everybody under control, is prevention, is to train your whole populace, to whip them into thinking that they could be observed at any time and to get them to interpret internalize society's rules. And, you know, so that if there are any criminals, then everybody else will be looking out for them. It's the neighborhood watch. But the steps in between there, which I think is where this whole idea of the soul, or we've picked on the epistemological aspect of the panopticon, that by being observed, the leader is learning something about you. And that relates to this formation of the self. I think we need to say a little bit more about the shift there. Which I think the first step in that shift is, and we're already saying part of the reason people got pissed at the sovereign and the executions weren't going so well is because it seems so arbitrary. Who gets the death penalty and who doesn't? And are you getting the death penalty and horrible for shoplifting, essentially? So there is a need to objectify, to make some of these things more transparent, to actually get a legal code, to define all of the laws in particular and make sure they're carried out. So that's a first step. We can go back to this formation of the soul thing. I mean, that's he's referring again back to the Nietzsche's genealogy of morals, right? Absolutely. With the the idea that the soul just is the thing that's sort of carved out when instincts get turned back inward. This is the Nietzschean version. And for Foucault, I think it's a matter of internalization. When you're internalizing discipline under the sovereign, Punishment works on the body, right? You're not trying to reform someone's character. We've left aside the concept of character at that point. The idea of discipline involves this notion of character, involves this notion that people, as Katie said, can monitor themselves. And now I think to Freud and the this idea of the superego where you internalize authority, basically. And so part of what it means to have a soul or a character as opposed to just a body is this internalization of authority. Yeah. So maybe we should back up for a minute and talk about how that transition from focusing on the act to focusing on the character of the individual takes place. Because I think this is where we start to see Foucault's idea of the permanent link between power and knowledge, which is such an important idea Mm. of his. What enables disciplinary power to focus on the character of individuals is that we start by building up a knowledge of individuals. We start cataloging them according to certain scientific or quasi-scientific criteria. So I think Foucault's very concerned with the emergence of what he calls the human sciences, right? These would include medicine or psychiatry, things of that sort, where you are taking a catalog of individuals in their deviation from the norm. And you're saying, actually, I think a great example of such a catalog is is the giving of grades in educational institutions. Ideally, we'd love everyone to be at the A level. You're a B. 
you as a person or a B student, right? So you are this far from what we want you to be. The D student is farther away than the B student. There's more effort needed to correct that. And individuals are carved out in that way. They're specified as individuals. And that creates space for getting at something interior. The more you know about an individual, the more you can develop strategies for bringing that individual closer to the norm. And so this constant surveillance, where you know everything about the individual, what they're doing at any given time, is going to be the most efficient. Yeah. It's not just your knowledge, it's their knowledge of your knowledge, right? If you were giving grades in secret, and the D student didn't know they were a D student, that wouldn't be such an exercise of power. It's right. the use of knowledge, and then the, the object of the knowledge is aware of, you know, I know I'm a D student. Yeah, the examination has to serve as both the evaluation and the punishment or reward yeah. simultaneously. That's why this works so well, right? Yeah. And it's different than the torture because it's not just a one-off, right? People carry around their own torture inside of them. They punish themselves when they deviate Yes, on a continuing basis. It's exactly. a superb way to make the person their own judge, jury, and torture or executioner and not simply rely on the political apparatus to do the work. Right. I want to just register a certain kind of disgruntlement in the following way, in that I understand and I'm in some ways sympathetic to many of the grind that Foucault has about this, about the incredible weight of modern society about this sort of thing. But again, I just want to point out the fact that the notion of self-discipline and owning oneself is a very old notion. And the kinds of mechanisms that we're talking about are not simply the mechanisms of self-torture. I mean, at the very least in philosophy, they go all the way back to Socrates. Okay. And, yes. and so, and so I, I just want to make this point that the yeah. characterization of this has one version of it in which you might even argue that it's a kind of perversion of it, a kind of abuse of the dynamic of the way in which the soul is formed by experiences of discipline, both from the outside and from within, and that the best version and flowering of the soul is one that is self-disciplined. And that's the only yeah. way of flourishing. But it gets perverted in some ways in this discussion, even by Foucault, where this constant emphasis on the debilitating effect of it. That's my disgruntlement. <laughs> so Foucault is completely aware of this. His later works from the period that follows his genealogical period, his ethical period, so for example, The History of Sexuality, Volume 2 and 3, are completely dedicated to exploring the idea of self-mastery that you get in ancient Greece, for example, and why that's not the same as what we're doing here. And the positive elements of power. It's not just all negative. It's not, right, you know, absolutely. power is bad, man. And No, he never says power is bad. Yeah. Foucault has never said that. And he explicitly talks about the positive effects of power. Right. Well, he did say it to me once, like in, an off, in a bar. We were drunk. Were you... <laughs> <laughs> were you were you in handcuffs at the time? Or? Yeah, I was gonna say, was this after you were shopping for leather in Greenwich? Like, what happened here? <laughs> so, moving on. Yeah, I think Foucault is highly ambivalent about this kind of self mastery. He at times even thinks that it's good to have that kind of self mastery in education. One of my favorite quotations that I like to throw at people who think Foucault's just all about domination is that he says, Power is not evil, it is part of love and pedagogy. So there's something yeah. even about these examples I'm sort of flippantly throwing out about education that he sees as valuable. I think you're absolutely right to have this feeling that we really should be ambivalent about this, that this is not all negative. I think what Foucault is trying to draw our attention to is that some of the ways in which we have become masters of ourselves 
are actually doing us potential harm. 